the starting point, as I say, is the, the fact that intellectual property rights have been shaped by Western countries through Western categories, but this intellectual property law can breach human rights and the intangible cultural heritage of those countries that were not part of the negotiations for these agreements. So which are the concrete risks for intangible cultural heritage? The employment of indigenous knowledge to general a commercial product, for example, a valuable drug. So you do have multinational companies that they come, they operate in China, or they operate in India, they operate in uh, Latin America and in Africa, and they take advantage of the fact that certain elements can be traditional, so-called traditional knowledge, can be biological components, have not been registered or protected through patent, they appropriate of these elements and they use them for producing a product, a valuable product for commercialization. For example, a drug. So if you think about all the problems related to traditional Chinese medicine, in the past, now it's changed a lot because China has been going, has been doing a lot to protect its traditional knowledge including the intangible cultural heritage, sorry, cultural heritage law, which includes also a component for intangible by People's Republic of China. Other countries did the same, but not all the countries have done the same, and there are certain difficulties to protect these rights, even though there is an adopt regulation, and we will examine later. Supplementary risk is the use by outsider of tribal names or other identifiers, sacred symbol or images or artistic designs. So you may have a certain tribal uh, groups or indigenous groups that they do have symbols of their religion. Sometimes they even cover those symbols apart from showing that during certain ceremonies, religious ceremonies or events connected to their tradition, connected to their specific uh, 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 ceremonies, can be marriages, can be uh, divinities, uh, sacrifice, can be whatever is related to the individual uh, sphere of uh, private religious uh, uh, aspects or can be even a collective sphere but still they are very important for these uh, uh, groups and they are not automatically protected by what we call intellectual property rights because they, none of the people in the groups have been thinking of protect them since they are private, religious and personal so how to do that? How to try to protect from one side to respect the individuality and the religious concern of these groups, but from the other side protect them because uh, it may happen that some, some, somebody, even a person of the group that leave the group, that leave the tribes, and try to, to take advantage of potential economic uh, aspects of these elements, be forbidden to do so. So that's the main, the main issues we will try to explore today. So for both, there is need of protection. So from one side, as I say, we have intellectual property rights. From the other side, we have intangible cultural heritage. The commodification of intangible cultural property is the translation of intangible cultural property into articles of economic worth. So something that you can sell and you can gain from selling this specific product. Can be exchanged for commercial profit through license, 
through rental or sale, direct sale. The exploitation and commercialization and consequently misappropriation of rarefied intangible cultural heritage can be limited somehow. As lawyers, we can try to find solutions with, of course, other experts in anthropology, sociology, political scientists, to find a way to rethink about how shaping the law in a way that protects these rights, but from the other way, you do not, you do not uh, uh, limit or breach the sensitivity and the feelings of an entire tribal or entire group of <coughs> indigenous people. But which are the main uh, legal problems that we have to put together copyright, to put together intellectual property rights and intangible cultural heritage? We will see that in the copyright issue, for example, we can try to see if copyrights can solve somehow this problem or patent can try to solve the problems emerging from intangible cultural heritage specificity. So we start to impose on groups that they do belong, do not belong to our society, rules that they do belong to our way of living and way of our society. Correct? What do you think? Your you should take the mic. Yeah. Uh, your presentation uh, is good. Uh, can take example for a country uh, where we have one of the national companies investing in good uh, production. We have uh, one tribe, it's called the Korea tribe. Uh, it has a, a, a natural dance which. Uh, it uh, it attains to the to the foreigners, but uh, it's not protected. And as my colleague said, it's like uh, they take it as a, as a their real life, their normal life. They know how to protect the IP, right? So it's, it's time now for people who understand about the digital property and digital property right to educate the indigenous how to protect the rights. Actually, we are talking, of course, in this like last on IP rights because uh, it was also a paper on IP rights, it's a curriculum on IP rights, but when we are talking about indigenous people, there is also a problem of protecting property rights, general, not only intellectual property rights. If, for example, you take the situation of uh, uh, Indians in the United States. What happened in that, in that, in that uh, period of time? We had colonizers coming and saying, I am the first in riding on this territory. I put my flag, this is my property. So the indigenous people of those territories were not applying these principles of property. So they were practically taking away of their own property and territory and lands. Do you understand what I'm trying to say now? So since we are in the romantic uh, way we were colonizing and bring uh, development and bring uh, knowledge and bring industrialized uh, 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 industrialized concept in these territories we were saying those territories do not belong to them because they do not they did not take care of having a regulate way to clarify to whom this lands, to do whom this property belongs. So, since nobody is uh, the owner, we can become the owner because we are the first discoverers. Okay, this is happening 
in, in uh, uh, North America, it happened in Latin America, it happened in Africa, it happened in many different countries through the history of colonizations. We need representation. We need to clarify who is representing the community. Who are the right people to represent the community? And we need a prior informed consent. Does the representative of the community uh, has the responsibility, has the possibility, is entitled to commit the community? If yes, autonomously, as a single-minded uh, decision, or it has to follow certain rules of the community, certain decision-making process of the community to say that the community was uh, priorly informed by the representative. Of course, this is incredibly difficult because each community has a different way. But that's the role of the, of the body, of the national body or office, to understand which are the communities in your country. It's your country. It's your <coughs> obligation to understand which are the communities in your country. It's your obligation to know how these communities are, are uh, regulating themselves. I'm not saying that then the community then will be happy in welcoming the officials of the, of the government Oh my God, come in my house and, and I will explain everything about our life and our community. Probably they will keep them out. I'm not saying that it, can, it is going to be easy, but again, those are elements, as lawyers, we need to consider a contract is valid when you do have everything clear. Who is signing? They need to be entitled to sign and they are entitled to sign through certain decision-making process that belongs to the community. Like every country or every region can sign certain agreements based on the fact that the, the president of the republic or the primary minister is entitled by the decision-making process uh, of the country or by the parliament or by the same. We need to try to understand according to the rules of the community and under the responsibility of the country or group, group of country to which the indigenous population belongs to, who is the representative of the community who, and how they do inform the community of certain decisions is also tremendously difficult because, as I said before, intangible cultural heritage can be for several centuries, communities change, certain communities they can say those are our heritage, other communities would say the same, but still having those elements and starting to think about it, starting to be nationally aware, nationally or regionally in certain situations of more countries involved, to understand who is the representative of the community, you would have already somebody who may sign and on the response, on, as a responsible for the community and in case of rights or even obligations, there is a somebody to whom the community responds and uh, the other potential company wants to exploit this intangible cultural heritage, they can relate and even the law would protect those rights through that representative. So the, 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 which is the subject matter here? The tangible expression of intangible cultural heritage are based on something that you can sell. Chinese, uh, uh, the Chinese law, the Indian law, the New Zealand law can withdraw the patent or the copyright registration in case there was not a clear disclosure of the, of the origin of the elements in case of a patent, for example, for medicine or in case of the origin of a symbol or a copyright that breached the interest of an indigenous population. That is already in the law, actually. 
but they do not, the law do not take all these elements in consideration. So they do not automatically clarify the representation, the prior consent, and so on. They take in consideration the fact that maybe elements have been used that have been not declared in the in the in the patent application or in the copyright request or registration and then it has been discovered later, can be withdrawn. In many other countries this doesn't happen. I mean this is absolutely doesn't happen because it's a responsibility of the other parties to register the patent before the other. I mean there are plenty of university research centers of company it's a fight to run, uh, to discover before the others that are maybe in the entire world they are working on that specific patent, three, four, five groups and they want to be the first to register the patent when they are able to have the credential to do it and if you are the first, it's done whatever are the needs of course if you didn't violate it, you did exactly what you didn't enter in the center, you still the thing but still, by contrary, in the in Chinese, Indian, New Zealand, or maybe even other countries, but I'm, I'm still studying the topic. So this was a first paper that tried to set a kind of research agenda broad, from a broader perspective. Now we are examining also the, the domestic regulations and potential violations, and based also on the rules, on the indication of the guidelines of the UNESCO and the, the, the WIPO. Uh, what do you wanted to say? Uh, as you just mentioned, China is a country rich in intangible cultural heritage. And as, uh, as far as I know, I did a lot of research, and I think that uh, until 2013, we have already declared certainly 37 uh, intangible cultural heritage, and there are still seven to be declared, seven to the on the list. So actually, we are, the governments have already done a lot to protect this kind of ICH. Mm -hmm. But uh, as, as you just mentioned, there are several questions related to the protection of ICH. For example, the origin, who is the original author, uh, creator, is hard to define. And the other thing I want to point out is that regarding to the varieties of different ICH, for example, we have different uh, developments in different areas. Uh, of this, the same ICH, and it's hard to define uh, specifically what kind of ICH you want to declare. And there's some similar similarities between the uh, ICH, and there are some uh, cross air overlapping areas. So it's hard to declare very clearly what kind of thing you want to protect. It's, that is also one of the problems with the <coughs> I agree, I definitely agree that the Chinese government is one of the countries that did a lot because that was the interest to do that, the protection of rights, economic rights, cultural rights. So it's, uh, it's definitely a very good example. It remains still a lot of to do, not only in China but in many other countries, because if the government does not want to protect a specific cultural, cultural heritage because I mean, it's not aligned, with the interest, with the political interest of the country, what is going to happen? They will forget maybe a minority intangible cultural heritage because they want simply to forget that minority. I'm not saying China is doing that. I'm saying that it may happen. But it's what, for example, China did with the, the minority rights law is very interesting because it's I believe that they did a law. Again, maybe it's propaganda, it's not reality, but still it's a lot what has been done for the minority rights law, even recognizing to uh, certain minorities economic rights or having stipend just because they do belong to minorities to protect the fact that they may have problems to find the jobs or to be to be economically productive, they do give a subsidize those populations for helping them. But again, I'm not an expert of all the minorities in China. There are human rights watchers saying that some of minorities are less protected than others. Some are even persecuted or uh, repressed. But they, as a lawyer, if I look to them up to the regulation and legislation, I would say that it's pretty scary better than other countries that they are considered high 
in or better in human rights protection. But of course, there is always the problem. What is written in the law is then going to happen in the reality. If it's going to happen everywhere in China or where some province not completely controlled by Beijing government, maybe they do what they want, even in violation of this uh, regulation. It's a continental country, China, like the United States, it's a continental country, plenty of uh, states uh, in Europe. But I would say yes, it's it's very interesting what you say because it's it's I agree with that. Of course, there are diverging uh, interests at central local level. But for example, what is happening in China regarding water management is dramatic because you do have uh, ministries at central level in Beijing fighting one with, uh, with the other to control the power and the economic impact of the managing of the water resources. Who is involved? The Ministry of Water Resources, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Environmental Protection, the NDLC, many different ministries do have overlapping competence on water. Plus, there are competence at regional level. How can you try to solve a problem when so many institutions they do promulgate sometimes overlapping or dissenting regulations about the same topics at regional and central level, and even at central level, different ministries doing different things and trying to control the to control the, the, to have the power on this specific matter. Why it happened that, and then I will apply to the topic of today, it happened that because the Ministry of Environmental Protection was uh, created as one of the most recent ministries and it has never been taken the, uh, a clarification, the time to clarify the competencies, the clear competencies, because they didn't want to cut competence to the other ministry. They could have never accepted to have less competencies. This is a one, and that one. And then, of course, for the complexity of certain issues, because if you're talking about water, drinking water, for example, of course it's an environmental problem, but it's also a health problem. So the Ministry of Health needs to be involved. When this is also applied at regional level, it's a worse scenario than a spaghetti ball. I was mentioning before, it's a confusion. What is the result of conflicting regulation and confusions? Violation of environmental laws by many private, national or international companies, pollution of the water, contamination of the water, that nobody is able to stop or to uh, uh, give responsibility because too many, too many uh, institutions are involved and nobody acts. And so there is a, this overlapping, create conflict, institutional conflict, plus the result that you do not have 